Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have done it. We've made it to the end of Organic Chemistry 1. In this video, I wanted to return to our roadmap of the course and just revisit the big ideas that we've seen throughout Organic Chemistry 1 and also talk a little bit about how these ideas are going to extend into Organic Chemistry 2 where primarily you'll expand your synthetic toolbox, expand your repertoire of reactions and learn some more advanced concepts primarily centered on how organic reactions work at the mechanistic level. So you'll see more complex mechanisms with more steps, bring in some of those elementary steps that we barely touched on but have great practical importance like nucleophilic addition to a polarized pi bond, and uh, really gain the ability to understand and construct complex organic molecules with a wide variety of structures. This is our course roadmap that was introduced at the very beginning of the course. And um, really it's divided up into two sort of stages. The first maybe half to two-thirds of the semester was centered on structure. So we learned how to represent organic chemical structures using shorthand. We learned about resonance and primarily the key in 2311 is recognizing when resonance is relevant to a given molecule or ion. Then we touched on really the first reaction type and what a reaction type that's going to remain important throughout organic chemistry too, and that is proton transfer, Bronsted acid base reactions, learning how to predict when they're favorable, um, about pKa values and how to apply those, and the structural factors that stabilize primarily positive and negative charges in charged reactive uh, intermediates or, or ions. And then we returned after that brief uh, foray into reactivity, which actually taught us a lot about structure and stability, we returned to a purely structural context with conformation, learning about the implications of molecular rotations. And while these won't come up that often in organic chemistry too, on occasion, the shape of a molecule will have a very important effect on its reactivity. Then we looked at kind of the, the next level up, if you like, of organic structure with configuration, stereochemistry, chirality, and stereoisomerism, looking at the differences between stereoisomers, recognizing when a molecule is chiral, when it's achiral, and this kind of thing. And stereochemistry will continue to be important throughout organic chemistry too. When we talk about the preview for that course, I'll show you an example of a reaction where a new stereocenter is generated, and so thinking about stereochemistry is gonna be super important. This is not something you want to forget or ignore as you move into organic chemistry too. Keeping in mind situations where, for example, a pair of enantiomers is created from an achiral starting material. We then moved into kind of the last structural topic, which was spectroscopy, the sort of rock bottom evidence for the structures of organic compounds, looking at infrared, mass spectrometry, and nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR spectroscopy. Depending on your organic chemistry two course, you may never see spectroscopy again, or you may see it on a regular basis. When you get into the laboratory, it's going to become hugely important because this is really the evidence you have that supports the assertion that you made what you expected to make based on predictions of what the organic product would be, right? So spectroscopy is super important in the lab context and that is just as true in organic chemistry 2 lab as it is in organic chemistry 1 lab. Now, after this point, we moved into reactions. And we started with a unit on general mechanistic reasoning and the elementary steps of polar reaction mechanisms. This was hugely, hugely important when we were first starting out, and it's going to continue to be so throughout organic chemistry too, where you're going to expand your synthetic toolbox, your repertoire of reactions. All of these various reactions are still going to be constructed from the same basic mechanistic steps. Ten or so steps of polar organic reaction mechanisms will remain relevant throughout organic chemistry too. Then we got into specific reaction types associated with particular functional groups. Substitution and elimination for alkyl halides. You'll see these return in particular contexts, although what will happen in organic chemistry too is that we'll actually primarily shift from thinking of carbon as an electrophile in an alkyl halide or a Lewis acid, something that wants to accept electrons, to actually a nucleophile. You'll learn about negatively charged carbons and organometallic reagents and enolates and other Lewis basic species containing a, a nucleophilic carbon. We 
first saw that actually with the reactions of alkenes and alkynes, where the carbon-carbon pi bond is a nucleophile. You'll see other examples of this in organic chemistry too. And then we looked at radical reactions, and this is really the only point in organic chemistry one and two where you'll see odd electron intermediates, these reactive intermediates with unpaired electrons. Then we looked at sp some specific applications of substitution and elimination reactions with alcohols and ethers, epoxides in particularly. This is kind of a good model for the reactions you'll see in organic chemistry too, where the focus is often on a particular functional group. You'll look at aldehydes and ketones, you'll look at carboxylic acid derivatives, you'll look at aromatic compounds. All of these various functional groups have reaction types that are manifestations of these general ideas like substitution, elimination, and addition. And by recognizing those patterns, you can make it easier to integrate the large amount of information that's going to come your way in organic chemistry, too. And then finally, we touched on multi-step synthesis, this idea of building up complex structures from simple starting materials using the reactions we'd studied previously. And again, this is going to continue to be relevant in organic chemistry, too, as your synthetic toolbox expands and you can make ever more complex organic structures as a result of that expanding toolbox. When it comes to chemical reactions, we learned that in an organic context where there are, for example, a lot of carbon atoms floating around in the reactants, we often have these issues of selectivity where one atom or another might pick up a bond to, for example, an electrophile when an alkene is reacting with some electrophilic reagent. That's what we've previously called regiochemistry. And this general idea of the regiochemistry of a reaction is going to continue to be relevant in organic chemistry too. And I just wanted to highlight one quick example of this involving the reaction of an aromatic compound with an electrophile. So we've previously seen alkenes react with a wide variety of electrophiles. And although aromatic compounds are quite a bit more stable than the corresponding alkenes, they can react with electrophiles as well. So something like this compound, which has a benzene ring, can react with Br2 in a halogenation reaction. This typically requires a metal catalyst or Lewis acid catalyst. So for example, we can add some iron in there to get this reaction to go. And if we look at the aromatic substrate, we're accustomed to alkenes potentially having two different nucleophilic carbons, right, the two carbons involved in the double bond, now we've got what sort of naively looks like six different carbons in this six-membered ring, all of which are sp2 hybridized and all of which it seems could donate pi electrons to one of the bromines. So we have this big site selectivity issue in these reactions. But one thing that makes our life simpler and builds on the skill of thinking about organic molecules in three dimensions and thinking about stereochemistry is recognizing that some of these carbons are equivalent. So these two carbons highlighted in red would give the same product if they reacted. These two carbons highlighted in blue, likewise, would give the same product if they reacted. So we've really only got three different possibilities here. From the perspective of transferring what you understand and, and learned in organic chemistry one to organic chemistry two, if you can even recognize this regiochemical issue in this reaction, you're already well on your way. In that course, you'll learn which positions react selectively and why, how this methoxy group comes into play, for example, and you'll really apply regiochemistry in these reactions with ease. Recognizing that there is an issue in this reaction is the most important thing at this point. Likewise with stereochemistry. So our primary focus in this course with stereochemistry has been on reactions where we've created a stereocenter from achiral starting materials, right? So we might start with, for example, an achiral alkene and add a group to one of the carbons of the alkene to create a new stereocenter. The same thing's gonna happen in organic chemistry too on a regular basis. And a classic example of this involves carbonyl compounds reacting with nucleophiles. For example, this carbonyl compound reacting with the methyl anion is a good example of this, where that nucleophile can add to the Lewis acidic carbonyl carbon. Don't worry too much about the reactivity at this point. The main thing I want to emphasize is the stereochemical situation, where this has created a stereocenter, and that can happen in a couple of different ways. 
that can happen like this, that oxygen, carbonyl oxygen gets pushed back behind the screen and the methyl group ends up above the screen, or the methyl could come from behind and end up behind the screen, pushing the carbonyl oxygen in front of the screen like so, and these are enantiomers. And again here, similar to the regiochemical issue above, We'd expect a racemic mixture of enantiomers here, and even recognizing that there is a stereochemical issue in this reaction is the key. Keeping in mind those fundamentals of stereochemistry that we've seen in this course, recognizing when a stereocenter is present in a molecule, recognizing whether a molecule is chiral or achiral, these foundational skills are going to continue to be important in organic chemistry too.